Open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, chapter 11 and verse 19. I would recommend to any young couple, any teenager, if you want your life to be enriched, set a goal of reading the Proverbs uh, several times during the course of a year. You will find it to be most profitable to you and to apply them to your life. Seek wisdom. Get understanding. The Word of God exhorts us here in this great book. And in this 19th verse, notice how it's worded. As righteousness tendeth to life, so he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. I do not know of any scripture any plainer than this, talking about the choice in life that people make, decisions they make concerning their future. Now notice the, t the contrast. As righteousness tendeth to life, so he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. That is, seeks it out, goes after it. I could think of a number of names that I could call uh, that uh, who have died in shame. As I've said from this pulpit, I happen to know Liberace. I knew Rock Hudson when he was a young man. And both of them uh, died with AIDS. And that's not a very pleasant way to die. And if what I read in the papers is correct, uh, those that die with AIDS are not too, uh, too enthusiastic about uh, the uh, kind of disease that they have that they die with. Now, let's just be honest and plain and frank about things. And if you pursue evil, to me, pursuing a life of immorality simply means that a person is going to die the death connected to the life that they've lived. Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes, as the tree falleth, so let it lie. That's the way you're going to die. And that's the way it is. Now this is contrary to the whole philosophy of our, of our country and all the way from politics to, uh, uh, you know, I heard Dr. Harrell was teaching there the other Wednesday night and I mentioned a Methodist bishop uh, that uh, in his writings he blatantly said that Jesus could have been uh, the child of a mercenary German soldier, uh, that he was an illegitimate child. He could have been. And this fellow was a Methodist bishop, or had been. Well, he died like all men die. I wonder what he thinks about it today. Have you ever thought along these lines, he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. Now, I'm greatly concerned for my country. We're in the midst of an election of, our, of a president for the United States of America. And there's been a lot of publicity said and reams of paper with print on them about the election between Mr. Clinton and Mr. Bush and Mr. Perot. But I want to tell you something, how distorted I think that uh, uh, the whole concept, and I certainly recognize the high and esteemed office of the President of the United States, but do you realize that uh, the uh, House and the Senate really, the House and Senate are responsible for the laws that's, that are made in this country and uh, the judicial branch, the Supreme Court, and the president is out there taking the gaff, yeah. taking the brunt of everything, whether he's Democrat or Republican. I, I uh, did not vote for Jimmy Carter uh, but uh, when he was elected president, but he took a lot of gaff that uh, really he wasn't responsible for because the office of the president, uh, it, just, it just happens to be that the person who fills that office gets the flack and uh, those entrenched office holders that we send to Washington. Take for instance, like Metzenbaum in this country. 
You find out what he's for and if you'll be against it, you'll be 100% right most of the time. I mean, you and I have to be too intelligent to figure that out. I'm the same way about Ted Kennedy. Uh, I just, these are my sentiments publicly expressed. And I'm an American and pay taxes. So uh, that's the way I feel about it. And those fellows don't represent me. They don't represent what I stand for. Now the whole issue is, am I concerned about the poor and uh, health care and all of that? Well, of course I am. Why wouldn't I be? Why wouldn't I have given my life serving people? So I, I think I can honestly say, but I want to tell you people today, uh, the American people are blind to a lot of things that's going on and we are so influenced. And let me, let me say this now, so you'll understand. We talk about the economy and uh, that has become the rule of thumb in this country. That's not what's wrong with us in this country. I know uh, I have people in my own church when General Motors closed here in our county, in Butler County, we had 6,700 hour workers that uh, most of them lost their jobs and uh, we had an enormous number of those people in Landmark Baptist Temple's membership. But you know, strange it may appear, I've been very careful to check out and you know those people who were members here and they tithed and gave offerings, it's amazing how they've been able to make it. Isn't that odd? Now we lost some of them. They had to move to another city. And they were their transplants. They've been moved somewhere else to other parts of the Midwest and so on. Uh, the economy is not what's wrong with this country. I can tell you what's wrong with this country. We are bankrupt spiritually and morally. That's what's wrong with this country. Whenever a, a woman like Madonna can uh, do all of those images, did you read in that paper? And the paper and the writer, God have mercy with those bodies that don't have, they don't have any heads, they write, you know, and it's, it's not like the IRS. It's a body without a head. And those writers influence us. They influence me when they write such despicable stuff. Or did you read about the, uh, the editor of Playboy magazine now? He's an old man in his late 60s. And uh, he barks, but he can't bark treat anymore. <laughs> you know, you've had dogs like that. They lose their teeth and they get mange and so on. And, and he's become a traditionalist now. Married to that young woman. And, and that has set the norm and the thinking, the moral climate of this country. I don't like it. I hate sin. Sin is destructive. The wages of sin is death. And we haven't, uh, you turn on television and these little possum-headed preachers all the time talking about healing and miracles, that's all they know. They don't know that Jesus Christ died for sinners. They don't understand that. I was watching television the other night and flipped one of them on that, and uh, there was an unsaved person, I presume unsaved in my home, and I thought, what a blast, what a blast. This unsaved person needs to be told that Jesus Christ loves, died for them, wants to save them. But all they're thinking about is that stinking body that's going to die anyway. And that's what's wrong with most of us. We are thinking about our physical discomforts and our physical needs rather than our spiritual need. You know, this book said, the poor you have with you always. The Lord Jesus himself did not when he was upon earth. And if that was his plan, he could have set up a utopia when he was here the first time. But that wasn't his plan. His plan was to die for sinners who were lost and going out into a Christless eternity. And he said, I'll be back in two days and then I'll, put, I'll establish a kingdom that'll never be destroyed and will not be left to other people. Strange the mentality in this country, all the way from the pulpit, all the way from Washington. We're in moral bankruptcy. And ladies and gentlemen, there's not anybody saying anything about it. 
in our public schools, our younger generation. God have mercy upon us that we'll realize when the Bible is out of the libraries of our school and you can't pray in the schools. Surely before God, the American people ought to wake up and realize that we're sitting on a time bomb. Don't let anybody kid you. Go back to Genesis 6. And God said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. You know what God did? He wiped them out. And uh, unbelievers will tell you that this planet has been deluged in water. So there was a flood. Visit Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot vexed his righteous soul from day to day because of the ungodly deeds of the Sodomites. Simon Peter says, and the Catholic Church says that he was the first pope. Well, that's what they say. But I want to ask you something. Was Simon Peter off his rocker? Did he tell it straight? He said, Lot vexed his righteous soul from day to day because of the ungodly deeds of the Sodomites. What happened to them? God wiped them out. I want to tell you, a moral climate or a moral climate like we're having in this country and our great newspapers over, the, uh, over this country, the first edition of USA Today, I bought it. I'm talking about in that first printing. But I'm disgusted with their section that's called life. It almost becomes pornographic because they indulge in that area and I know they say, well, this is what sells newspapers and all. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. The hours late in this nation of ours when we are not shocked at anything. I heard a well-known evangelist say back in 1976, he said, I expect to be living when you'll see on television and out on the streets people having sex. I thought he must be off his rocker. That's 1976. That's only 16 years ago or 17. Uh, look, we're already about there. This climate in this country today, amoral, that is, we don't have any morals, and our churches and our people who go to church, I want to ask you landmark people, uh, are you righteously indignant about what's going on? You want me to tell you how I can prove to you your feelings about the iniquity and the licentiousness and the immorality in this country. And now every state in the union doing their best to get lottery. We've got a generation of people that's trying to make money without working for it. And you need your, your religion examined if you go to grocery stores and service stations or wherever and buy lottery tickets. I don't want to hear any of my members doing that. You're a crook if you do it. You're trying to get something that's, uh, that's dishonest. Do you understand that? Come on. You can get up and walk out if you want to. But I want to tell you something. God Almighty is looking down upon the United States of America. Here we are without any morals. Here we are trying to educate our kids with the receipts from, uh, from gambling, from lottery. We flood this country with alcohol and now never say anything about it. And we've got dope everywhere. When will America wake up and realize he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death? In the fifth chapter of the book of Daniel, there's a man that tried it. He was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had a son by the name of Nabonidus, and then he fathered Belshazzar, and Belshazzar made a feast to a thousand of his lords, and they drank wine before the thousands, and he ordered the gold and silver vessels taken from the house of God when they took Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and others into, uh, into Babylon to retrain them to teach them rock music and to teach them immorality, change their language and all, and you know what? That night when Belshazzar was at the height of his, uh, of his feast, God said, I think I'll send him a special delivery letter. I think I'll call his number and over on the wall, on the plaster of the wall next to the candlestick, God told Belshazzar, you're too light. I'm going to let 
I'm going to let your enemy come in tonight under the walls of, of your great city and they're going to destroy you. Thou weighed in the balances and found mourning and that night Belshazzar was slain and Darius reigned in his stead. Don't laugh. God Almighty said the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and he turneth it whithersoever he will. The American people are thinking the economy is what's wrong when we're in spiritual bankruptcy. God's able to heal our nation. He's able to give us abundance. God is able to take care of his people. Uh, but we better get first things first. If the blind lead the blind, they all go to hell. They fall in the ditch, Matthew said, meaning into destruction. And so with this in mind, let us look at pursuing evil. And you know in the same proverb letter he said, there is a way that seemeth right unto man. But the end there are for the ways of death. What kind of a choice in life have you made with you and your family? How has Christianity changed you? Has it really changed you? Or are you, uh, uh, do you have your mind on yourself all the time? I said to the uh, church for their anniversary earlier today, I said, you know, recently, in the last few years, I've come to realize I don't really need to pray for myself. I really don't need to get my mind on myself. I can't do anything much about it anyway, except to sleep when I need to and eat when I need to and go ahead and work to the best of my ability. If the God whom I profess to love and serve, if he's not able to take care of me, forget it. I can't take care of myself. The ravages of diseases and everything, anyone ought to know that you are not immune to disease and death. That's why a lot of these preachers so-called are so worked up. I believe God can... What I'm trying to say is that I'm alive today at my age because God Almighty wanted me to live and I've tried to be obedient to him and we work together on it and I'll say this to you today, when God finishes with me, I'm gone and I can't do anything about it. And so will you be. And so the moral climate that I create in my own family, the moral climate that I create in my own church, the moral climate that I try to create in my community is important in the eyes of God. I'm not going to change this world particularly, but I lift my voice and talk about the evil like Noah did for 120 years. And then God took over. And let me tell you people something. You've got your priorities all mixed up. You spend your waking hours and you think about yourself and all, and I'm for people having a good time. I really believe, I really believe that Christians ought to be happy. Our brother Matt Holman preached about that this morning. And I'm a firm believer uh, that our joy ought to be full. But you can be in a hospital in a critical condition and still have the joy of the Lord. Circumstances doesn't alter your relationship with God at all if you're right with him. And so ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. Uh, you better, when you go into the booth to vote and when you lift your voice, I'm not at all interested whether I'm an independent Republican or Democrat or socialist or whatever. I'm interested in the moral and spiritual climate in this country, with my country, with my people. We've got so many bloated things. Imagine a baseball players making $7 million a year to work six months. This whole thing is, is out of culture. Where did all this come from? You, want to you want me to tell you where it started? It started with rock music. Started with musicians. 
and the bloated salaries that we have today, millions of dollars when a, when a rock singer can make $60 million a year and all of this and, and they're supported, they get free publicity in newspapers and people uh, worship them, they're little gods. Uh, sooner or later, that country is going to sink into the pits of God's wrath and judgment because God doesn't like it. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's what this book says. Now, he that pursueth evil, pursueth it to his own death. What, what road are you traveling then? I said, we cannot, we cannot build a utopia. Jesus didn't do that when he was here. He's coming back to do it, but he didn't do it when he was here the first time. Now, let me tell you something. You and I are not going to do it. I'm practical. I'm a pragmatic person. But I tell you what, we can help some people while we're making this journey. And that's what life and living is all about. What a, what a wonderful, wonderful experience it is to be a Christian, to have a little light and to let it shine that others might follow the light. It's one of the most wonderful experiences. I've thought about it a great deal. How then the providence and economy of God that he would so fix it to where men would be saved by the preaching of the word and then take people of all classes and sizes and accomplishments and let them take this blessed book and teach it on the Lord's day and live it and testify it and let it be the rule of their life and practice. What a marvelous thing it is. God is sovereign. He doesn't have to use humankind, but he does. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing what God can do? Let me tell you a story. I uh, knew a couple lived on East Irwin Street in Tyler, Texas. He was a businessman. And uh, he and his wife, members of, of another church, but had never really been saved. And I led them to Christ. And they became members of my Central Baptist Church where I pastored. But this lady, her mother was an invalid. She had been stricken with some strange disease. And the woman had spent years in bed. I want to confess to you that as a young preacher, that intrigued me because this woman loved God with all of her heart and she listened to me on radio every Sunday night. So he, she and I became friends. In a small town, you, you just about know everybody. And so I, it was customary for me to visit her. And uh, I, she'd write me a letter and enclose a dollar or something for the broadcast. And anyway... I was so intrigued with her. She loved God. I know she did. And you know what? She had told me, said, Brother John, I believe it's in God's will someday for me to walk again. And there were so many fascinating things. Her daughter was a, was a meticulous housekeeper. I never, with all the years that woman was bedfast, I never went into that home when there was any odor whatsoever. She always seems to be so clean and neat. Time passed on. I left that city after spending nearly 11 years there. Would you believe after I moved to Ohio, that woman was healed and she eventually walked again and it was the most marvelous thing. I had the privilege of having known her for years as a, as a cripple in bed with some strange disease. And now she's able to walk. She still praised God and gave him glory. I'm telling you, men and women, uh, God lets people have experiences like that to help the rest of us on occasion. And I'll confess to you, when I, when I saw what happened to her, it made me have a stronger belief that my God can just do about anything. Amen? That's the way God works. He's sovereign. He'll let things happen. God uh, is watching over the affairs of men. And I want to tell you now, this leads me 
uh, to the national picture again. Going back to the days of Israel, they had uh, manna every day. They ate manna that came down from heaven like coriander seed and it, tastes, it had a sweet taste like honey, the book said. Moses tells us that, but our David did in the Psalms. And you know, <clears throat> those, those Jews, uh, they'd, had, uh, uh, they'd cr had an appetite created by being in, with the Gentiles and so they decided they wanted meat. And you know what? God said, I'll give you flesh to eat. And on the morrow, God permitted quail to come in about waist high. It uh, looked like they came in from the sea. And those, uh, those Jews worked for hours, for 24 hours, killing quail and cleaning it. Boy, we've, we have us, uh, we've, we're going to have us, uh, uh, we're going to have us a banquet. And they did. And while the meat was in their teeth, God sent them convulsions and they died. Many, many thousands of them died. They got what they wanted and neglected what they needed. And you know, men and women, that's what's going to happen to America. I'm telling you, unless, unless there's a, there is a wave of prayer and seeking God and those of us who know the Lord, listen, Hear me, hear me clear and plain. God will send these people meat to eat and this country can go down the drain. He'll give us what we want. Don't let anybody kid yourself. We don't, listen, sure the economy is, a, is an important matter, but let me, let me shock you people. Why don't, uh, why don't these people take in surveys Ask us in churches like this one. Well, Dr. Rawlings, uh, with the recession on, has your offerings gone down? Don't be shocked. Our offerings haven't gone down. Sit on that one a while. When times are hard, God's people go right ahead worshiping God with their tithes and offerings. Amen. Amen. Isn't it amazing? I said to some preachers the other day out on the, in, in Washington State, we were talking about this. I said, no, it hasn't affected us particularly. Our people have been taught to give and God's people will give in good times and in hard times. Fact the business, if I want to be definite about it, sometimes when the pressure's on you, you're inclined to be more honest with God than you are whenever everything's pleasant. Let me just whisper that. Did you get it? Because suddenly you are alerted and you realize, I need God. That young co-ed years ago in an Ivy League school that heard a radio station playing the song Till a Storm Passes By that Herb and the choir presented in 1964. And that girl wrote a letter about what happened to her. She called the station and found out where to send the letter to Cincinnati, Ohio. And you know what she said? I needed God. What does these beautiful young women in college need? They don't need to cohabit with the men. They need to preserve their virginity. They need to preserve uh, their morals. What they need is God. That's what young men need more than anything else in the world. You know, it's appalling to me when this country and the media and not, not everybody would make a hero out of Magic Johnson. I can't understand it. Isn't it strange? And yet our young boys and girls you saw performing up here before the telecast, the broadcast, and... Uh, they read the paper, they say, well, I guess everything is about the same. You know what? You know what a grandma was telling my wife the other day? You know where women gossip is in these, what do they call them, John Beauty Salons, isn't that it? You know about them? Well, one of the ladies in there is telling my wife, said, they have a nine-year-old grandson. 
and he reads newspapers and he watches television. You know what he said? He said, I can tell when Bill Clinton's lying. Nine years old. He said, I can tell when he's lying. Boy, that's shocking, isn't it? Amen. You know, these kids of ours are not quite as dumb as we think they are. You say, well, do you... Well, I'm just telling you what the nine-year-old boy said. I'm 70 years older than he is. <laughs> but I can tell pretty well when people are lying too. Can you? When I pick up a newspaper and I see things covered up, I want to ask you something. Do you measure everything with what this book teaches? Is your moral standards, are they drawn according to this book? We don't have a man and woman problem in this country to, with people who believe this book and practice it. You men listening to me, you know how to treat a woman. You don't need the government to tell you uh, that sexual harassment is wrong. If you are a student of this Bible, you know what's wrong and what's right. One thing that I learned as a kid from the time I was old enough to even listen, my daddy taught me, you respect women. You respect women. Listen, when this book is your guide, you're going to, you're going to have it straight. You say, but you, you call me a thief and I bought some lottery tickets. Yeah, I really did. Quit it. You don't have to die a thief. You don't have to die an immoral person. You don't have to die a liar. You don't have to die a gossiper. God will help you to clean up your life. And I want to tell you people something. You better examine your life in the light of the word of God because if God's angry with you, you've had it. When God is angry, and you know what he said in the same book, he's angry every day with the unrighteous? That's what he says. Did you hear what he says in Psalms chapter 1 of verse 3? But the wicked are not so, but they're like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Friend, listen. My relationship with God is more important than the relationship I have with my wife or with my family. My relationship with God is preeminent above everything and beyond everything. Does, is God pleased with my life? God judges me. God will judge me by my reaction to sin and what sin will do. God doesn't want a preacher to stand in the pulpit and soft pedal on sin and its destructiveness. He wants people to be warned. He said to warn the wicked of his wicked way or I will require his blood at your hand. And when I die, I plan to die with my hands clean of the blood of the people of Cincinnati and over the country where my television and radio broadcast reaches. I intend by the help of God to be able to say like Paul of old, I am free of all men's blood. Let's stand for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, may our people, may their thoughts be arrested. May they stop and those who have listened to realize the destructiveness of sin, to realize that he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death, that the wages of sin is death, that Israel was a stiff-necked and hard-hearted people and they died in the wilderness. Oh God, our God, help us to warn the lost man of his way. With our heads bowed, you know God said a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. And our lives need to be balanced you're in the world, it's true. You can't stop the flood tides of sin. But one thing about it, you can lift your voice, warning those whose heart God has touched to help them to flee from the wrath to come. And that's what the book said. And the book said that in old days, the earth was shaken. But God said in the book of Hebrews that heaven and earth is going to be shaken so that things which can be shaken shall not remain and the things that cannot be shaken shall remain. 
And I want to tell you, if you're not upon the rock, Christ Jesus, destruction awaits you. But if you're anchored to the rock, you've got it made. I mean, you have it made.